it is expected that the entropy of a system increases with an increase in temperature. To show this, we will start with small changes in entropy, or ds, is equal to small changes in q reversible, or dq rev, divided by t. And since for small changes in heat transfer, dq is equal to the heat capacity times dt, then we can substitute this in and get ds is equal to c dt over t. Now if we integrate both sides, what we get is delta s is equal to the heat capacity c times the natural logarithm of the final temperature divided by the initial temperature. Note that if the process is performed at constant volume or pressure, it's all right to substitute the corresponding heat capacity term in. Now let's do a quick example where we calculate the change in entropy when we heat up a sample. So in this case, we're going to have to calculate the change in molar entropy for a gas when it's heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius at a constant volume, where they give us the molar heat capacity at constant volume. So in this case, again, we go back to this term that we just calculated, being delta S is equal to the heat capacity times the natural logarithm of the final temperature over the initial temperature. In this case, delta S is equal to well, we've got the number of moles times the molar heat capacity at constant volume times the natural logarithm of 30 plus 273.15 divided by 20 plus 273.15, being I'm converting my degrees in Celsius into Kelvin. I then divide both sides by N, so I get a molar heat capacity on the left-hand side, and I can substitute in my molar heat capacity at constant volume, 22.44, times the natural logarithm of 303.15 divided by 293.15. And so what we're left with is 0 0.75 joules per mole Kelvin. Keep in mind that when the heat capacity cannot be considered a constant, for example, solids at very low temperatures, then the starting point is still for infinitesimal changes in entropy, or ds, is equal to the heat capacity C times dt over t. Then a substitution for the function that describes the heat capacity is inserted and integrated between the initial and final temperatures. The figure on the right illustrates this calculation. Another case to consider is what happens at phase boundaries. The entropy of a substance increases when it melts and when it vaporizes. The transfer of energy is heat when the substance is at its melting or boiling point is reversible. And if the pressure is held constant, then the entropy of fusion is equal to the heat of fusion divided by the temperature of fusion, and the entropy of vaporization is equal to the heat of vaporization divided by the temperature at vaporization. Now here is an example where we're going to deal with enthalpy of vaporizations. And in this case, we're looking at a case where we're trying to calculate the entropy of vaporization of water at 25 degrees Celsius, where we're given a heat capacity at constant pressure, um, for liquid water, a heat capacity at constant pressure for gaseous water, and finally we're given the heat of vaporization at 100 degrees Celsius, or 373 Kelvin. And so the process that we're looking at is that if temperature, if I'm just drawing a, a plot where temperature is increasing as it goes up, what we're interested in is understanding what is this entropy change as I go from liquid water to gaseous water, or vapor, at 25 degrees. The information that we're given, though, doesn't allow us to do this direct calculation. But instead, what we have to do is we have to heat up our liquid water until we get to liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius. We then convert it to water vapor, and then we cool it back down so that we can then get it back at 25 degrees Celsius. And because we have a state function, or because entropy is a state function, going straight across from just liquid to gas at 25 degrees Celsius, well, we can also use this roundabout route where we go up to 100 degrees Celsius to then use the values that are provided and then cool it back down after it does the phase transition to find gaseous water at 25 degrees Celsius. We can use that also to find the change in entropy for this process. So then to calculate this process, we're just going to break this down into three steps, where the first step is just going to be this heating process, the second step is just going to be this phase transition, and then the third step is going to be this cooling process. So if we start with step one, then we're just heating the water. 
And so then we have our delta s. Well, that's equal to this integral of ti to tf of the heat capacity times dt over t. And in this case, they give us the heat capacity at constant pressure of liquid water, which is a 75.29. And so I can then substitute in n times cpm, since our process is at constant pressure, our ti and our tf. That's what our bounds of our integration. And we have dt over t. And in this case, then I can move this n that I have here, divide both sides by n, because I'm asking for a molar heat capacity or a molar entropy. So delta s over n, cpm 75.29. This integral of dt over t is the natural logarithm of t evaluated between 25 plus 273.15 to 100 plus 273.15, since we always write these things down in Kelvin. And so then, once I evaluate this term, what I end up with 16.88 joules per Kelvin mole. The second step in this process, well, that's the phase transition. So we have the change in entropy of vaporization. Well, that's equal to the heat of vaporization at 100 degrees divided by the temperature. And so in that case, what we have is our delta H of vaporization at 373. So that's 40.7 times 10 to the 3, just because I want to express all this stuff into joules. Since it's a molar um, heat capacity, then I'm going to multiply it by N to end up have the total amount and then I'm going to divide that by 373, since that's the temperature this number is from. And so what I end up with is the entropy of vaporization divided by n, since I divide both sides by n. And when I evaluate the 40.7 times 10 to the 3 divided by 373, I end up with 109.1 joules per mole Kelvin. The final step is the cooling back down step. And so in that case, I go back to calculating this integral again, where I've got the integral over Ti to Tf of the heat capacity times small changes in temperature divided by the temperature. Well, in this case, my heat capacity is a molar heat capacity at constant pressure. So then that's times N times Ti to Tf, the integral of Ti to Tf, dt over T. In this case, I'm going to divide both sides by N to again get a molar entropy. My molar heat capacity at constant pressure is 33.58 for gaseous water, which is what I'm evaluating right now because that's what I'm cooling down. The integral of dt over t is the natural logarithm of t final over t initial, where t final is 25 plus 273.15 divided by 100 plus 273.15. And so what that leaves me with is a molar entropy for cooling down gaseous water being equal to negative 7.53 joules per Kelvin mole. Now all we need to do is just sum up these three values that we've calculated for each of the three steps, where this first step was heating liquid water up to its boiling point. We have the enthalpy, or sorry, the entropy of vaporization. And then finally we have the molar entropy change as we cool down gaseous water back down to 25 degrees Celsius so that, again, we can determine what is this direct pathway or what is the molar entropy for the transition between liquid water and gaseous water at 25 degrees Celsius. So that just means I'm going to write delta S total divided by N, and that's going to be equal to 16.88 plus 109.1 minus 7.53. And so the total entropy change for this process is 108.4 joules per Kelvin mole. Changes in entropy of the system can also affect the entropy of the surroundings, since heat can be transferred into or out of the surroundings. Using the same definition as before, delta S of the surroundings in contact with the system is delta S surroundings is equal to the reversible heat transfer with the surroundings divided by the temperature. 
Since the surroundings are so enormous compared to the system, its pressure will not change. So we can write the heat transfer Q as the change in enthalpy of the process, being delta S of the surroundings is equal to the change in enthalpy divided by the temperature. Since the enthalpy is a state function, then it does not matter if the process is reversible or not. As a result, we can write delta S of the surroundings is equal to Q of the surroundings divided by temperature, which is equal to the negative of the heat transfer of the system divided by the temperature, where the minus sign reflects the heat coming into the surroundings represents heat leaving the system, and this is equal to the negative change in enthalpy divided by the temperature. Let's now look at an example which illustrates this point. So what we have is an ideal gas that's expanding isothermally from some initial volume to a final volume, and what we're going to calculate is the molar entropy change in the surroundings if the gas expands, in the first case, reversibly, and then if it expands freely, being that there's no external pressure. So if we look at the reversible case first, well, we know in this case that the work is equal to negative nRT, natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. And we know that, in this case, the work is equal to the minus of the heat transfer. And this is essentially because this is the first law of thermodynamics we're using. But the first law is the change in internal energy is the work plus the heat. But since it's isothermal, then the internal energy or the change in internal energy is equal to zero. So that means the work is equal to the negative of the heat transfer. What this means is that I can now solve for Q. And that means then the heat transfer of the system is just equal to nRT times the natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. Since the heat transfer of the system is the negative of the heat transfer of the surroundings, that means then Q surroundings is equal to negative nRT, natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. And so substituting this into the expression for the change in entropy, change in entropy of the surroundings, well that's equal to the Q of the surroundings divided by T, and it's the reversible heat, and that's what we have happening. And so then that just means that I have nRT, natural logarithm of Vf over Vi, divided by T. And so I can cancel out my Ts. And I forgot a minus sign here. And so what we're left with is negative nR, natural logarithm of Vf over Vi. What if now the expansion happens freely? What that means is that the external pressure is equal to zero. So if I was to calculate the work from this, well, the work, by definition, is the negative of the initial volume to the final volume, or an integral from the initial volume to the final volume of p external dv. But in this case, p external is equal to zero. So that means that my work is equal to zero. And then following through with this exact same formalism that I just calculated for the reversible process, well, I know that that means then that my heat transfer is also equal to zero which means that the heat transferred to the surroundings is equal to zero, which therefore means that the delta S of the surroundings, that is also equal to zero.